This is the Friday, January 8th, 2016 version of the Market Plus segment. Joining us now is Ted Seifert. Ted, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. We're glad to have you back. Real quick, I wanted you to explain your comment made during our corn discussion on the program. You talked about a triple doji day. What's a doji? Okay, so a doji is where you have a decent sized range during the trade day, but you end up closing the day right around the same value that you opened at. Basically, it means that you know we went into the day and came out of the day the same way, even though there was movement during the day. <clears throat> in corn, we had three days like that. In two of those days, we made new contract lows, but we weren't able to close down at new contract lows. We popped back to right about where we opened the day. So, uh, you know, it's a chart pad pattern that a lot of the technicians, the candlestick technicians in particular, look for. Uh, the triple doji days at a high a lot of times can mean a reversal lower. At a low a lot of times can mean a reversal higher. Uh, but if you think about really what that means though, uh, we tried pushing corn and successfully got corn to new contract lows two days in a row, but we were unable to close down below previous contract lows and we popped back to unchanged. So what that means is that selling interest at those new contract lows is really waning. There's not a lot going on there and you've got, even got some buying bottom picking going on down there. Uh, so if you're short and, and you have this massive short position, i.e. the funds, uh, and, you're not, and you're seeing this market that's not able to extend into new contract lows and, and post that solid close below that previous contract low, low, then I think you're sitting there and getting a little bit more nervous about the position that you have. Yeah. And, and I think that's part of the reason why we were higher on Friday. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm reluctant to put a whole lot of stock in that. Really, I'm always reluctant to put a whole lot of stock in technical formations when we have a big USDA report coming up. And this January report is definitely a very big USDA report that could set the tone for some time. Uh, but if this report is ends up being pretty close to expectations, then I think we revert back to looking at that technical formation that we put in here this week. And maybe we're able to build off of that. Okay. So now as we talked about this report on the program, big short positions not going to take much more than a neutral to even slightly bullish report to give us a big or at least a decent sized bump higher in this corn market. What's the strategy for producers if they feel confident that this thing could take a run, but they don't want to take the risk on futures? Well, I've been an advocate of longer term calls, um, you know, and I think this is sort of the right time to do it. And with the, with the potential for this report, in my mind, again, the January report a lot of times is a big mover. For me, I don't see a whole lot of, I don't, I, I see a hard time, I have a hard time uh, coming up with a scenario where this is a supremely bearish report, we're limit down or we're, you know, 15 cents lower in corn, 40 cents lower in soybeans. Um, the only way I can see that is if we, if we have huge significant increases in yield and production numbers. Uh, I don't really see that. I, I think the market to some extent has already factored in the idea that we could see some higher production, production numbers. <clears throat> so it'd have to be shocking. And I, I don't think we're going to get that. Can the report be negative? Sure. But is it going to be a big negative limit down day? I think there's a very low percentage chance on that. Okay. So I, I've, been, I've been looking at calls. I, I do think there is a chance that if this is a big shocking report, it could be to the upside. It could be from that these first stocks number coming in a bit lighter than expected. Uh, maybe production is overstated for last year. Uh, and then you could spark that big short covering rally coming from the funds. You could spark the, uh, the aggressive buying from end users as well. Uh, and that could give us a nice pop. So uh, that being said, yeah, again, I like long-term calls, mm -hmm. but if you want to just make a report play on there, uh, there's some February or March calls out there to be had at reasonably good prices. Um, I was buying those March 370 calls yesterday for four and a half, four and three quarters of a cent. They got a little bit more expensive here on Friday with the rally, uh, but if you get a little bit of weakness early Monday, that might be something to take a look at. All right. Now we've got a question here from Chad in Randalia, Iowa. And Chad has, is asking, have corn and soybean markets found a bottom yet? It seems like potentially we'll know on Tuesday. Yeah. And then he's curious, what might the near-term upside potential be? And I think we've discussed that pretty well. Mm -hmm. So I want you to look out a little bit longer term in these corn and bean markets in particular. What do you see 2016, 2017? Where's this grain market going? Okay. So I think that at some point, You've got, you've got a bit of a powder keg sitting there. And, and you know, with, with the fact that funds are as short as they are and end users don't have coverage out for a very long period of time, uh, again, I'm, ge I'm generalizing there, but uh, I, I think there, there is a large percentage of the end user that 
has needs to be covered for quite some time. And I think that they're looking at uh, the longer term weather outlook that we could have for our growing season uh, and just the idea that we're you know, very cheap right now. And I think they're ready to make that happen at some point once price action gets a little better, at least puts a little bit of fear in them that maybe we're done going down. Um, when you get that spark, uh, it, and, what, and when that spark comes, I'm not exactly sure. It could be this report on Tuesday, but if it's not, I still think that hap some, happens sometimes in the next few months. Uh, you could see a pretty aggressive move uh, coming from front short covering as commercials come in to add some length as well. <clears throat> Those two big players competing for, uh, f with competing bids, that could be very interesting. And, you know, I look at that December 16 corn contract, and I, I think in order to get the acreage that we really need going into next year, we should be at four and a quarter going, in, going into the end of February. If we're not, and I'm not so sure we will be, it just doesn't seem like the market is going to do that short of a big bullish report sure. on Tuesday. Uh, but if we're not, you know, I, I really wonder if what we're going to do as far as corn acreage uh, this year. I, we could see an increase because of that corn-soybean ratio, but I'm not so sure we're going to see this big two, three, four million acre increase in corn this year. And that puts us in a very fragile position going into our growing season because what happens on 83, 84, or, uh, I'm sorry, 82, 83 million harvested acreage uh, for corn, or let's say we have 91 million planted acreage in corn, what happens if we have a subpar growing season? The last two growing seasons, we've been saved by the idea that we've had record or near record yields. <clears throat> in 90 million acres, or an 82, 83 uh, million harvested acreage number, if you have a yield somewhere in the 150s, all of a sudden, we're talking a very tight balance sheet. And again, commercials, I think, know this very well, <coughs> are looking at that and at some point have, are going to be looking to make making more aggressive uh, purchases. Um, and, and then when you look at the weather and for what we have going on currently to try to make some analogies to some analog years that we've, we've had in the past, and if you look at the longer-term weather forecast that we have for this growing season, there has to be some level of concern there. Um, <coughs> if you look at... The warm temperatures that we had in October, record uh, mm -hmm. warm temperatures in a lot of areas, um, near record November, record December, so warm temperatures, fairly reminiscent of the fall and early winter that we had in 2011 going into 2012. Uh, then you've got the El Nino situation, which is a 100-year strong El Nino that is seems to be capitulating, and you wonder what the, the outcome of that if we have a very, very strong La Nina. Uh, which could cause some problems for our growing season. And then finally, you look at the precipitation totals that we've had from November 1st through December 31st, and we, we've, we've had a record there. Now, you think about other years that we've done that in. Um, in fact, nine years since 1960, we've had uh, uh, two years where we've ended up above trend line by a little bit. We've had one year where we were, all, were almost exactly on trend line. Okay. We've had six years where we ended up below trend line for corn. Um, and on average by quite a bit, 14 to 16 acres below mm. trend line. You also look at the years that we did that in. We did that in 2012 where we set, we had one of the wettest November 1st through December 31st timelines. So 2012, 88, 93, and 83 are, are the top four. There. Okay. And 93 was the wet year. Yeah, so that was, was 83. That was, yeah. yeah. So you had two very wet years similar to what we saw last year, but that continued on a lot further. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you have two years that were followed up by, by drought. So, you know, again, I, and finally, I mean, you just look at the odds of having a third record or very close to record national average yield in a row, or you can even argue fourth really very good crop in a row, yeah. uh, and you wonder, especially with changing weather patterns. So, <clears throat> again, I think the market at some point is going to have to put a bit of a, a premium back into the market to see, e well, first to either buy acres, and if we can't get that done, then I think we have to put a premium in the market for the risk that we have going into this growing season. Well, no, and that really opens up, I think, us well for Kevin's question. Kevin Dunlap, Iowa, is wondering, will CRP acres increase with these lower crop prices? Yeah. Are farmers going to need to start putting land back into set-asides just to get through? Or do you go ahead and plant and hope for higher prices 2017 and beyond? I, I'm asking my guys to plant, you okay. know, and, and that's not just because I want, I want to see more bushels, but... Um, I'm asking my guys to plan because I think the savvy guys look longer term at what the potential is for these markets. Right. 
uh, and the idea that we really can't stay below break even for an extended period of time without losing a ton of acres. Um, you know, but overall, I do think that you have a big move towards CRP. I think that you do lose acres in the big three as a whole, or big four if you want to include cotton. Um, so I, this isn't a year where I think we're gaining acres overall. I think we will lose some. The question is how much. I'm not sure we'll lose. Into where? Right. Do you see it into CRP, back into pasture? I mean, where is, if I've invested in a new combine. Right. Well, a mix pasture. of CRP, pasture, but also uh, things like, say, sunflower, barley. Okay. Uh, Some of that. The that sorghum thing is really cool down as China is. Outside the Corn Belt ground. Right. Moving back out of corn. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, you know, so, but I, I think overall we are looking at a bit of a, of a decline in, in acreage across the grain spectrum and cotton as well. <laughs> um, although cotton might increase in some acres a little bit this okay, year. Okay, and now we didn't get a chance to talk cotton on the show. Where do you see cotton moving here in the short term? Do you see cotton moving in the short term? Well, you know, cotton's very much tied into the dollar, and, you know, the dollar's had a sort of wild fluctuations here this week, but end of the week, you know, kind of firming again. If that dollar continues higher, I have a really hard t time seeing a big bounce in cotton. That, and I think, uh, I think there's a chance that we're going to see an increase in cotton acres here this year, uh, going back to the conversation we were just having. Uh, so I, I have a hard time really seeing much strength in cotton going forward, unless you get a big rally in, say, corn and beans in the next couple of weeks, and then maybe cotton has to fight for some acres. Okay. Um, you know, so we'll see about that. In the short term, I, I see more downside, I think, for cotton, uh, or at least sideways trade. I, I, I have a hard time seeing upside. Um, but, you know, if you get, if you get some, uh, some movement, some positive action in the grains, maybe that can change things around a little bit. But going back to... You know, what do we do longer term uh, with, with uh, as far as strategy for corn, mm -hmm. soybeans, wheat? Where do we go with that? Um, I'll say this. You know, I, I've been accused as, a, a, or I've been called a, a perma bear. Okay. Uh, and I'm always bearish in markets. And I'm, I'm at a point right now where I have a hard time being really very bearish. Okay. <clears throat> and, and while I do want to use proper risk management and things like that, the recommendations that I've made as far as percentage of, uh, percentage of sales, forward sales, or, or hedged is maybe lower than what I've had, quite a bit lower than what I've had in, in years past. Uh, I think <clears throat> the game plan that I'm kind of taking this year um, is to make cash sales when needed, you know, because we all need money flow from time to time, um, especially this time of year. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to make cash sales when we have to. But I'd like to reown those bushels using call options or possibly futures, depending on your risk parameters. Uh, but at very least, using call options so that if we do get a rally, you're able to participate in, in better prices down the road. Maybe that can help your, your break-even prices, uh, maybe get you even profitable, depending on how much of a rally right. you're able to have. Uh, I also don't mind the idea of owning call options on bushels that we've yet to sell. Sure. So try to double up on a rally a little bit. Or you know, if we get a 60-cent rally, you know, maybe we can pull 40 cents out of, out of cash. Or even if you get a thirty cent rally, maybe you're able to offset basis, a decline in basis, something of that nature. Yeah, thirty cents in this environment's not bad. That's really not bad. I mean, almost ten percent. You know, not so bad at all. That's sort of the approach I'm taking. I'm a lot less aggressive making sales either on the board or buying puts, okay. things like that. Right now, um, I, I'm looking longer term. I'm looking towards the end of the growing, middle end of the growing season. I'm looking at what weather could do. Okay. Um, and and I, I like the chances for some higher prices. All right. Well, Ted, thanks so much for joining us this week. And I know you've got a busy weekend planned. Yes. Coloring the new market-to-market -market coloring sheet. So you can find this on our Facebook. Go check it out. We've always got fun stuff up there. And uh, some folks don't care for how I pair my tie and my shirt. <laughs> now they can decide. We're almost matching. I know. I was thinking about right. that. We're great minds. Think yeah. alike, ladies My and son can't wait to do that. Well, he's, good. He's been... Uh, he, he, the plan is to do that tomorrow morning. He's really looking forward to it. Perfect. So. Well, we're looking forward to seeing it. <laughs> Share it on Twitter at the Ted Spread for Ted Seifert, and you can find us at Market to Market. Thanks, Ted. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks to all of you for sending in your questions via Facebook and Twitter. Please continue to do so, and we will get expert analysis right to you. Thanks for watching, and have a great week.